Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we'll be discussing Book 4, Chapter 22 of Deadhouse Gates, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Testify. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We'll be covering the events in the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book, but that ship sailed a long time ago. I dropped some minor spoilers, not big ones, but you know, some minor stuff. So again, minorly sorry. I'm not sure where we stand actually on days without incident. I think we've both dropped the ball recently. <laughs> Yes, for clarity, <laughs> I have to own the last breach of conduct last week. I dropped one. I had to beat myself. I left it in because I have integrity, oh. and I'm not going to make myself look better by <laughs> omitting my mistakes. <laughs> I thank you, sir. Yeah. You're good. You are a good friend. <laughs> A quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence. Listener discretion is advised. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. And we really mean that. If you'd like to show your love and support to us, you can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, chapter 22. The chapter starts in Mala's city. Faint ripples licked the garbage-studded mud beneath the docks. The bank seethed in the egg-laying frenzy of some kind of eels. In their thousands, black and gleaming, the small creatures writhed. From the darkness beyond came the sound of cascading water. The ripples that reached shore from that commotion were larger, more agitated, the only indication that a stranger had arrived to disturb the scene. Kalam stumbled ashore, collapsing onto mud that swarmed beneath him. Warm blood still leaked between the fingers of his right hand where it pressed against the knife wound. He wore no shirt, and his chain armor was even now settling somewhere in the mud bottom of Malas Bay behind him, leaving him with only buckskin leggings and moccasins. In clambering out of the armor during his sudden plunge into the deep, he had been forced to pull off his belt and knife harness. In his desperate need to return to the surface to draw air into his lungs, he'd let everything slip from his grasp, leaving him now unarmed. He really has the deck stacked against him in this scenario. I know. It's a really grim way to start running a gauntlet, isn't it? <laughs> it is. He's weakened from blood loss. Yeah. He just had to swim and hold his breath. And then now, yeah. now he has no weapons to defend himself. He's just down to his jammies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Somewhere out in the bay, a ship was being torn apart. The savage noises drifting across the water. Kalam wondered at that, but only briefly. He had other things on his mind. And this commotion would be the encounter between the Kenrila demon that Pearl summoned and Apt aboard the Ragstopper. Okay. Faint nips told Kalam that the eels were resenting his intrusion. Struggling to slow his breathing, he squirmed farther up the slimy bank. Broken crockery dug into his flesh as he made his way onto the first of the stone breakwaters. He rolled onto his back and stared up at the underside of the pier. A moment later, he closed his eyes, began concentrating. The bleeding in his side slowed to a thin trickle, then ceased. That's a pretty nifty skill. I imagine it would take a lot of training to be this in tune with your own body. Is this skill or do you think it's magic or magic assisted? I think it's skill. I don't think Kalam uses any magic at all. I don't think he does either. We know something later on, but I, I don't know if that's vague enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You are treading dangerously close know, to the I'm line, back away. Billy. I'm back away. I'm backing away. I'm leaving. I have my hand over the beep button right now. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm safe. I'll... There's no retaliation here, by the no. way. <laughs> Me yeah, jumping on an opportunity to not be the last one to mess it up. No pressure, no, sir. Actually, no, you actually helped me to, to keep from growing over the line. I appreciate that. <laughs> A few minutes later, Kalam sat up and began pulling off the eels that clung like leeches, fleeing them out into the darkness where he could hear the skittering of the harbor's rats. The creatures were closing in, and he had heard enough whispered tales to know he was anything but safe from the fearless hordes in this underworld. Have I ever told you the story of my rat encounter in Nigeria? Um, no, sir. <laughs> okay. Why don't you go ahead and tell us? <laughs> 
before I began my current job, I think I've mentioned that I used to go offshore in the oil and gas industry. And we had yes. a contract with Shell Nigeria. And right we had to ship our equipment over there in pieces. And we were at the dock for, I want to say it was two to three weeks, reassembling the equipment before we put it on the vessel that we were going to take out to the site. Okay. At this location, it was a fenced compound because Americans have to be under guard the whole time they're there pretty much. And I had heard stories of the rats that were in and around the trash cans. One of the guys that I worked with walked up to one of the dumpsters and opened it. And he said there was a rat the size of a small dog oh, wow. right at face level and it hissed at him. So I had this image in my head. <laughs> I was working the night shift and I had to go use the restroom in the building. So they had the offices where the restrooms were and they didn't have doors into this building. They had kind of that butcher rubber stuff hanging from the ceiling, yeah, you know, like yeah. when you think of in a butcher area, yeah. it's three in the morning. I walk through that flexible material that keeps the AC in. Yeah. This is pretty straight hallway, about 40 feet and directly in front of me, this rat comes flying around the corner and it was drifting like dogs do when they lose it's <laughs> grappling with its rear legs. Yes. I didn't have time to process how big it was. All I knew was it was coming right at me. <laughs> and all I could do to react was jump in the air and it ran right underneath me out the door. <laughs> My heart, <laughs> my heart was beating so hard, dude, because I had this image of these massive, almost radioactive rats, right? That had been oh all gosh. over the place. That's and this thing's funny. come fly. Oh, oh gosh. It, it all oh. happened in the span of less than probably three, four seconds. It was so fast. But oh, yeah, Lord. I about had a heart attack. <laughs> What was it running from? I don't know. Bigger rats? Um, Maybe somebody had a broom or something was attacking. I didn't see anybody else. I just oh, continued on to the restroom. But well, <laughs> I, I, when, I, when I hear rat stories, you know, I'm always thinking of the old movies where they show a bunch of rats. And a lot of times they'll use possums as rats because they look like giant rats. It, was it that size of a rat? Possum sized? This one, I don't think it was. Okay. It was larger than the rats that I see that I've killed in my attic. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I've, been, I've been unfortunate enough to have to deal with that scenario. Oh, oh. It was probably double the size of the rats that I've seen. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any feed lines in your house left? Yeah, of course. Okay. I haven't had one in a while, so I know that they'll they'll move in if they know they can get around them if you ain't got them. So I well, was just they're not outside they cats. And then I wouldn't set them loose in the attic because there's right. spray and insulation up there. I wouldn't want to put the cats no. through that. Yeah. No. My cat, the new one, is a softy. I okay. say that she could probably be a murder machine if she needed to sure. be, but she's also pretty young. We adopted her. The cat adoption network was working overtime. She showed up at my wife's job as a stray cat and okay. adopted my wife. My wife brings right. her home. She's a calico and she spends all day either sitting in my lap or crying at me for something. She's very right cute. On. Okay. I have a new cat. Okay, good, good. I don't have one right <laughs> now, but actually my wife's getting the fever. She's not a cat person. You know, I turn turn ladies into cat ones apparently because I'm a cat guy. I've always loved them, my, but my dad has those short hairs, and so I, we always go and see him. And she, and my dad's cats are starting to really. He's got the most skittish bunch of cats I've ever known in my life. It's taken me years to get them to be cool with me, and they're starting to like her pretty quick. So she's kind of being like, "Oh, they're so cute." I'm like, "Yeah, dude." <laughs> <laughs> I, I feed outdoor cats here and everything else here because we mm -hmm. got, like I said, I told you, got foxes, deer, porcupines. It's all here. It's a whole different energy than dogs. It is, dude. Even when they're demanding and strange, it's different because it's a different intelligence level, dude. And a lot of it. it, it <laughs> Some people would take offense to that. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's a, it's a different thing. The cat's got a cat's got about a three thousand word vocabulary versus a dog has got about a three hundred word vocabulary. I'm sorry, vocabulary speaks. And cats manipulate the snot out of us. Absolutely. I've learned that they do that, that soliciting purr that they do, that one where they trill a little bit in there. Mm -hmm. That is like, that goes to the core of people's beings, apparently. Like that mimics something that babies do. Oh, yeah. they, only do they only do that really on us. And of course, they only meow for us. Cats don't meow normally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're controlling us, dude. It's a psyop. Oh, it is. It's, it's <laughs> We've been absolutely. domesticated for the cats over thousands absolutely. of years. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Kalam could wait no longer. He pushed himself up into a crouch, eyeing the ragged piles that rose beyond the breakwater. If the tide had been in, the massive bronze rings bolted three quarters of the way up those wooden bowls would have been within reach. Black pitch coated the piles except where ships had been thrown against them, leaving gaping dents of raw, water-soaked wood. He thought, 
Only one way up then. He made his way up along the base of the barrier until he stood opposite a merchant trader. The ship lay canted on its side in the mud. A thick hemp rope stretched from its bow to one of the brass rings high on the pile. Under normal circumstances, the climb would have been a simple one, but even with the inner discipline that was part of a claw's training, Kalam could not prevent fresh blood welling from the wound in his side as he made his way up the rope. He felt himself weakening as he worked his way closer to the ring, and when he reached it, he paused, limbs shaking, while he sought to recover his strength. I think that answers your question about whether it's magic or yeah. some type of training. I think that inner discipline that he's referring to there is what's stemming the tide. Agreed. There had been no time for thought since Salkilan had pitched him over the side, and none now. Cursing his own stupidity was a waste of time. Killers awaited him in Malice City's dark, narrow streets and alleys. His next few hours would, in all likelihood, be his last this side of Hood's gates. Kalam had no intention of being easy prey. Crouched against the huge ring, he worked to slow his breathing once more, to still the seep of blood from his side and the countless leech wounds. He thought, eyes on the warehouse roofs with sorcery-enhanced vision, and I've not even a shirt to hide my body's heat. They know I'm wounded, a challenge to the higher disciplines. I doubt even Surly in her prime could manage a cooling of flesh in these straits. Can I? Once more he closed his eyes. He thought, draw the blood from the surface, draw it down to hide within muscle, close to bone. Every breath must be ice, every touch upon cobble and stone a matching of temperature. No residue in passage, no bloom in movement. What will they expect of a wounded man? Not this. This almost reminds me of the reverse of what Wim Hof, known as the Iceman, what he's capable of doing. He can withstand really cold temperatures through breathing techniques. Yeah, what a beast. I mean, I'm not very aware of this fellow, but the guy that we worked with, you know Mike from Lost Prevention, he's really into rock climbing now. He turned me on to Wim Hof and do... That guy is a fascinating man mm -hmm. by what he's able to do. What's funny, I also wanted to point out something here. I caught when I was reading it. I don't know if you caught it as you read through it. Is that a mistake when it talks about the leech wounds, the countless leech wounds, little eel wounds? <laughs> yeah, that looks like a typo. I'm not saying this about you, Mr. Erickson. I'm sure you did not write that typo. <laughs> it's your editor's fault. Sir. There was another typo in here that I had to correct. Oh, did you? It's later on. It's something about they're tying each other together with the rope. It said right. trying. Oh, that's right. I didn't check the printed version. The digital can be artifacted differently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who knows how they scanned it in. Yeah. Separately, this would be a pretty useful technique to fight a predator with pulling yeah. the blood into <laughs> your body to adjust your temperature. Because yeah. ultimately, that's all Arnold was trying to do yeah. in the first one. He's masking his body temperature with the mud. Yeah. That makes oh, me think, yeah. what would a, a Malazan Predator crossover <laughs> look like? <laughs> dude, that would be bad news for the Predators, I imagine. Dude, bridge burners, Marath munitions. Dude, these, these jokers would be taking the dirt that fast. I mean, have you, and, and the other thing, have you noticed that Predators never technically win? Every time we become aware of these guys, they always lose. In Predators, did all of them die? I think they got them, fellas. Because they were taken to that jungle, to that preserve, and the and the humans the, the humans prevailed. You're right. You're right. <laughs> that's a great movie, though. That's one of the best ones. I love Predators, man. By the way, that's great. That's a fun one. Yeah, it was a good revival. It had some good stuff in it. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you do you what I think? Uh, I wonder. I love an archer. There's a great reference to Predator. They're in the jungle. An archer. A lot of this archer is always looking up. And it's like it's Lama mm -hmm. looking at us. Wonder what are you doing? Says, oh, oh, you're looking for Predator, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the alligators in the swamp. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> he's always looking for Predator, and he's like, oh, oh, and it's it's that. I love that when she's like, oh, it's like that. Real, she realizes he's really looking. <laughs> <laughs> he's really looking for predator isn't he? yeah so uh, the only movie i can think of where the predator made it was an alien versus predator and a bunch of them died but one of them did get out right didn't it yeah i think so or, did, I, or no 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 I, no, no, no. I, I take it back i can't no, no. hardly remember no it's, he died and then another one came and gave her the award <laughs> every no, single I, time it's human bias it is human bias <laughs> These humanists writing these books, what are they thinking? I know, it, I, but I posted this fantastic meme this week. It showed us a xenomorph skull 
at the mm. entrance to the cave of Kairbana, where that rabbit from the Holy Grail is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like Xenomorph versus that rabbit of Kairbanar. I'm like, which, which, which prevails? It's like no contest. It's like no contest. It's like, that rabbit could deal with the acid blood? It gets out of there before the blood even jets, dude. It Come had on. blood all over it after it was That's done killing all those people. What are you talking about, dude? It, <laughs> that is true. It was bathed in blood. <laughs> I think it could withstand it, sir. Okay. I think it, I think it could withstand it. I don't All know. Right. He didn't withstand the holy hand grenade, so he may not be able to withstand it. But that was it, holy, it, though. That, that is otherworldly power. <laughs> that is true, but the alien couldn't have withstood that either. True. So to be fair, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I just think it's amusing, though. It was... Wow, what a digression. Went all Sorry. the way back to. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I start. I started it, but I mean, <laughs> we went all the way. We go back to Alien. Yeah, Alien versus versus the Bunny from Holy Grail. Uh, yeah. AVB. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Alien versus Bunny. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> Kalam opened his eyes. Release one. Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> What would the xenomorph <laughs> that spawned from that look like? Oh my word! Yeah, I'm sure it would be somewhat. I don't even know what the word for rabbit is. What are they? What is their kind of name? I got no idea. But would it look like that? I'm assuming it would have to, wouldn't it? They always mimic the life form they come from. Yeah. So oh, it'd be like that's, that's horrific. Kind of cutesy a little bit. Cutesy bunny rabbit that's going to eat you, <laughs> dude. That's horrific. <laughs> Listen, we should probably use a generative ai oh my and word. prompt it and see what it would come up with yeah i'll try and work on it'll that's probably right. be like well this is the property of 20th century fox now owned by disney you are not allowed to use this that could be too i've run into some things like i i might it's always involved i don't know why when i've tried that stuff it's always like stupid i always type in like uh samurai cats <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> i had this great samurai siamese it did for me it's brilliant dude but then it's like dinosaurs in bomber jackets smoking cigarettes and flying planes you know shooting at things and sometimes it won't do that because it does it's like violence but i had a world war ii scenario based out with dinosaurs mm -hmm. in uniforms yeah and but what's funny is it works kind of okay until you start digging into the picture itself and you realize that what is it doing here there's adding weird bits to it, like hands and feet, because it's, you know, it's trying to make things look like it. I've had it design album covers. I did a, a band logo for my friend, and he's actually using it as his band logo. Nice. <laughs> and it's like, okay, right on. That's cool. <laughs> They've been having good luck playing the clubs lately. So I'm like, all right, cool. Nice. I feel kind of cool. <laughs> Kalam opened his eyes, released one hand from the ring, and pressed his forearm against the pitted metal. It felt warm. Time to move. The top of the pile was within easy reach. Kalam straightened, slowly pulling himself onto the guano-crusted surface. Front street stretched out before him. Cargo carts crowded the locked warehouse doors facing onto the street, the nearest one less than 20 paces away. To run would be to invite death, because his body could not adjust to changes in temperature fast enough and the bloom would be unmissable. He thought, one of those eels has crawled too far and is about to crawl farther still. Flat on his belly, Kalam edged forward onto the damp cobblestones, his face against them as he sent his breath down beneath him. He thought, sorcery makes a hunter lazy, tuned only to what they expect will be obvious, given their enhanced senses. They forget the game of shadows, the play of darkness, the most subtle telltale signs, I hope. And this is a really important lesson when it comes to remembering your fundamentals. Think about navigation today compared to when we were growing up. Right. Nowadays, people are wholly reliant on their phone for directions, and in many cases, don't have a mind map of roads in a city like we did. Yeah, that's funny. I, I'm sure you do too, but you still have a bunch of unused routes in your head, I'm sure, that you, you, know, that you used 20 years ago that you, you know, never are going to see again, probably. You remember maps yeah. go? Do you remember the maps go? No. You could buy them for the cities that you lived in, and it was, man, imagine a, a book of maps. Mm -hmm. But it was grid. It was grid sectioned of the entire cities, like Dallas. The maps go. You're talking about this thing is about half the size of a phone book in width, mm -hmm. and about the size of you know. It's just kind of in a binder type, like a ring binder type thing. All you had to do is look at the street, and you didn't know where you go. It would show you exactly in really painful detail where it was. Maps go, man. That was a big deal for a long time. And I'm so I've become dependent on this stuff, but. 
I've always been very fortunate that if I've gone to a place once, are you like this? Can you kind of remember how to get there? Even if it's not, even if I don't remember names of streets and stuff, can you generally remember how to get back to a place? It depends on how complex the scenario and what the landmarks are like. Okay, and I'll give you an example. There's a neighborhood that my wife's aunt and uncle moved to north of Houston, mm -hmm. and it all looks the same because they're still building it out and it's really big. There's a lot of lots that are undeveloped. So it's just a bunch of trees, wooded area, and they built out okay. the roads for the neighborhood. So now I know what turns to take, but the first couple of times we went there, I always got confuse this sure. one's a right this one's a left because there was no visible landmarks to remind me of which turn it was you know and right. i didn't have the street yeah. names memorized yeah so if there's visible landmarks normally i'm pretty good about it yeah agreed kalam could not look up but he knew that he was in truth completely exposed like a worm crossing a flagstone path a part of his mind threatened to shriek its panic but he crushed it down higher discipline was a ruthless master of his own mind his own body his own soul his greatest dread was a break in the overcast sky above the city. The moon had become his enemy, and should it awaken, even the laziest of watchers could not fail to see the shadow Kalam would throw across the cobbles. Minutes passed as he slid his agonizingly slow way across the street. The city beyond was silent, unnaturally so. A hunter's maze prepared for him should he manage to reach it. A thought slipped through. I've been spotted already, but why spoil the game? This hunts to be a protracted pleasure, something to satisfy the Brotherhood's thirst for vengeance. After all, why prepare a maze if you kill your victim before he can even reach it? The bitter logic of that was like a hot dagger in his chest, threatening to shatter his camouflage more thoroughly than anything else could. Yet he managed to slow his rise from the street, drawing and holding his breath before looking up. He was beneath the cart, the top of his head brushing the flatbed's underside. He paused. They were expecting a contest of subtlety, but sleight of hand was only one of Kalam's talents. He thought, always an advantage, those other unexpected ones. He slipped forward, cleared the first wagon, then the next three before coming to the warehouse doors. The cargo entrance was, of course, huge. Two sliding palisade-like panels, now chained together with a massive padlock. To one side of them, however, was a smaller side door, also padlocked. Kalam darted to it and flattened himself against the weathered wood, both hands closed on the padlock. There was nothing subtle in the brute strength Kalam possessed. While the padlock itself resisted the twisting force he delivered, the fittings that held it could not. His body pressing against the lock and latch muffled the splintering sounds. Lock and fitting came away in his hands. Cradling them, Kalam reached out and pulled the door back just enough to let him slip through into the darkness beyond. A rapid search through the main chamber led him to a large tool rack. He collected a pair of pick tongs, a hatchet, a burlap sack of cloth tacks, and a barely serviceable work knife, its tip broken and its edge heavily nicked. He found a blacksmith's leather work shirt and slipped it on. In the back room, he discovered a door that opened onto the alley behind the warehouse. <laughs> so basically, he has blacksmith tools now. Right, yeah. Does this have the feel of a D&D &D session to you? He's just like, he's a <laughs> self check, looting, perception check. <laughs> It's very much so, and I, and we both know that Mr. Erickson is a huge D and D lover. So I'm assuming this could be showing some of his love for that. But because it, it feels like it here, getting ready for the setup, <laughs> getting, ready, getting ready for this campaign is what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> the dead house, Kalam judged, was about six streets away. He thought, but Sulky Land knows, and they'll be waiting for me. I'd have to be an idiot to make straight for it, and they know that as well. Slipping his various makeshift weapons into the shirt's tool loops, Kalam unlatched the door, edged it open a crack, and peered out. Seeing no movement, he pushed it open a few inches more, scanning the nearest rooftops, then the sky. No one, and the clouds were a solid cloak. Faint light bled from a few shuttered windows, which had the effect of deepening the gloom everywhere else. Somewhere in the distance, a dog barked. He stepped outside and patted down one edge of the crate-littered alley. A pool of deeper darkness occupied an alcove near the alley mouth ahead. Kalam's eyes found it, locked onto it. He pulled out his knife and hatchet and without pause swept straight for it. The darkness poured its sorcery over him as he plunged into the alcove, his attack so sudden, so unexpected, that the two figures within had no time to draw weapons. The brutal blade of the work knife tore out one man's throat. The hatchet chopped down to crush a clavicle and snap ribs. He released the weapon and slapped the palm of his left hand over the man's mouth as he drove the head back to crunch against the wall. The other claw, a woman, slid down with a wet gurgling sound. 
A moment later, Kalam was searching their bodies, collecting throwing stars, throwing knives, two braces of short, wide-bladed stickers, a garrote, and the most cherished prize of all, a ribless claw crossbow, screw-loaded, compact and deadly, if only at close range. Eight quarrels accompanied it, each one with an iron head that glistened with the poison called White Peralt. Yes, upgrades. Sweet. Nice upgrades, too. Yeah. <laughs> that poison comes from the Peralt spider, and this is the same poison Vorkin used when attacking Daradan and Baruch in Gardens of the Moon. Only Baruch had the antidote for it. Others don't know of the existence of that antidote. So yeah. everybody thinks you die when this stuff gets into your body. Yes. <laughs> <They do. laughs> Rightfully so. Yeah. Kalam appropriated the thin black cloak from the man's corpse, pulling up its hood with its gauze vents positioned over his ears. The projecting cowl was also of gauze, ensuring peripheral vision. The sorcery was fading as he completed his accoutrement, revealing that at least one of his victims had been a mage. He thought, damn sloppy, toppers letting them get soft. He emerged from the alcove, raised his head and sniffed the air. A hand's link had been broken. They would know that trouble had arrived and would even now be slowly, cautiously closing in. Kalam smiled as he thought, you wanted a quarry on the run. Sorry to disappoint you. He set out into the night, hunting Claw. The hands leader cocked his head, then stepped into the clear. A moment later, two figures emerged from the alley and closed to confer. The leader murmured, blood's been spilled. Topper shall be. A soft clicking made him turn. He said, ah, now we learn the details, as he watched their cloaked companion approach. The newcomer growled, the killer has arrived. The leader said, I'm about to pluck Topper's strand. The newcomer said, good, it's time he understood. The leader said, what? He was interrupted as both of his companions fell to the cobbles. An enormous fist connected with the leader's face. Bone and cartilage crunched. The leader blinked unseeing eyes that filled with blood. With septum lodged in his forebrain, he crumpled. Kalam crouched down to whisper in the dead man's ear. I know you can hear me, Topper. Two hands left. Run and hide. I'll still find you. He straightened, retrieved his weapons. The corpse at his feet gurgled a wet laugh, and Kalam looked down as a spectral voice emerged from the dead man's lips. Welcome back, Kalam. Two hands, you said? Not anymore, old friend. Man, this is so good. I'm getting flashes of Gary Oldman's character in The Professional mm. when he's like, everyone! <laughs> yeah. Uh, dude, that's one of my favorite. That's one of Oldman's. Well, he's one of the greatest villains of all time in that role. Yeah. <laughs> It's really disturbing the way he acts. Oh, he's fantastic, dude. Oh, my word. He's fantastic. Yeah. Movie. He's what makes the movie so dead gum good, I think. Agreed. <laughs> I was just thinking about it. Topper speaking through this dead man's body. Mm -hmm. What Warren does Topper, or what, I guess, what magic? Would do that? Is um, he, what is the aspect hmm. of his magic? I have no idea. Who else interfaces with dead bodies? Well, necromancers, I guess. And what Warren do they? Is it Hood? That's what I'm thinking. But the, I only know of two necromancers. <laughs> 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 so that doesn't answer me a lot because I don't know much about them. But I haven't read. Yeah. I've got their other stories. I haven't read them yet, though, because those guys are too funny. Man. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So maybe something else is at work here. Maybe any Warren, because a lot of these guys use Warrens to bend them and bend some natural laws to do things that, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that using a corpse as a telephone is the same thing as, you know, using Hood's realm or Hood's Warren possibly, you know, maybe it's just, maybe they're able to just use the Warren as, a, I don't know, as a, some kind of, uh, as some kind of like, you know how, imagine two tin cans together with a string in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> the Warren is the yeah. string. Billy, I'm sorry. I'm still stuck on using a corpse as a telephone. I got this <laughs> really bad Ed Gein image. <laughs> it's okay to have that image. It's, it's a, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad I give you such horrific images, sir. Um, <laughs> but it is what they, but it, it is what they're doing. But maybe it's quite literally like like I said, just the two tin cans with a string between it, and the Warren is the string, and maybe that you can use any Warren. Because remember the stuff that Cult did. What was his Warren? The stuff he did in the in the, 
in the realm with the Salanda, where he helped navigate some stuff. I thought Mianist. He was Shadow, wasn't he? Man, that's what I was thinking, too. So it's Shadow, but at the same time, I mean, Shadow is Shadow, is my mind. So how does he do physical things with it? I don't know. In that case, that's an illusionist ability. I would take it as, because he's pitching his voice at other areas to make it sound like he's there. Yeah. That's kind of what I think I was getting at a little bit too, was thinking of that or Makra or whatever that would help you throw your voice technically. That's what I'd be getting at. It's like a ventriloquist act. <laughs> but it's two but it's two way, because he can hear Kalam. Right. A meat telephone. Wonderful. <laughs> 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 Moving along. <laughs> Kalam asked, scared you, did I? Oh. Topper said, Sulky Lan appears to have let you off too easily. I shall not be as kind, I'm afraid. Kalam said, I know where you are, Topper, and I'm coming for you. There was a long silence, then the corpse spoke one last time. By all means, my friend. That pause. You think Topper is scared? You know, if not, he should be, but... I'm going to have to quote Master Yoda here. You will be. <laughs> <laughs> you will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think he likes to act tough, but oh, sure. Kalam's making him nervous here. Think about this. Kalam just punched a guy so hard, <laughs> he caved his skull in. Yeah. I mean, who does that? And he's wounded. And he's using a lot of brain power to keep himself cool <laughs> looking and, you know, not register on anyone's thermals. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> dude. That is the brute strength. What is Kalam like? Is this guy built like LeBron or is he like, you know, is he seven foot two? I, it just, I know he's built like a footballer, but is he built more like a rugby guy? Is he like one of the yeah, New Zealand something All like Blacks? That. Like one of the really big <laughs> rugby players. And there are next level strength people, a lot of them growing up on a farm or something yeah. where they did yeah. physical labor from youth where yes. if you train in some type of physical <laughs> job whether it's a blacksmith or something from youth mm -hmm. then maybe that led to him being just freakishly strong compared to the yeah. average person that could that remind have you ever seen this guy anatoly online yes the, the, you, yes oh my i just discovered that fellow this week and dude that is that's kind of funny because of that fact, the way he looks underneath, underneath, because all these other guys are so huge and he's so tiny. Yeah. And he's picking up these weights like they're nothing. I think we <laughs> talked about a couple episodes ago where he's lifting up something that's three, 400 pounds to mop yes. under it as the yes, janitor. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh my word. Yeah. The janitor mopping. He, he does a couple one armed where you're like, oh my gosh, he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's you're like, what? I mean, that's next level. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. The Imperial Warren was holed like cheesecloth that night, as hand after hand of claw pushed through into the city. One such portal opened directly in a lone man's path, and the five figures announced their arrival with gasping breaths and splashed blood, the swift and as swiftly done noises of dying. Not one had managed more than a step onto the slick cobbles of Malice City before their flesh began cooling in the gentle night. Screams echoed down streets and alleys as denizens foolish enough to brave the open paid for their temerity with their lives. The claw took no more chances. The game that Kalam had turned, turned yet again. This scene right here, I'm imagining a panning shot of a dark city where there are periodic flashes all over the place as these hands descend upon the city to attack him. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's the best way to visualize it because they're supposed to be stealthy, right? But we would need some yes. way of showing that just oh, yeah. that escalation you want to build that tension of this city is under assault right now. All of yes. these people, everyone is showing up. Yes, every every claw, every available claw to the scene, please. Yes. <laughs> every available hand on set, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this feels like another point of escalation to me. Not oh, to the man. cosmic levels like it's been lately no. with some of these strength, but escalation in this scenario for sure. Well, what makes this truly amazing is the fact that what this says about Kalam and what we obviously don't know about this man yet, but what we are learning, because think about this. In this whole book and in the last book, we see some flashes of Kalam doing some beastly great stuff. But I mean, this is a kind of a longer running thing. This, this is where we see him be more him than ever, I think, through this bit here. And I mean, to, to send this many folks after him, he, it, they must think that's what it's going to take to get him. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one of us will get lucky and kill that son of a gun. It's 
<laughs> so to our knowledge, he's already killed 10. Yes. He killed the two <laughs> and then three and then five more that appeared right in front of him. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, wow. And he started out with nothing but pants and moccasins and he was bleeding. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, he's, he's like getting stronger and meaner as he goes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that kind of what it seems like? It's like he gets, it's like he gets angry. It's like, it's, it's like he's just turned on to this. Like, okay, now it's on. It's like, now it's on. Yeah, he's in beast mode right now. He's in his element for sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I love seeing him work. Oh, dude, absolutely. He's a real, because it, it brings things from the cosmic level down to the more personal level when you get to Kalam. Yeah. We go to Tremor Lore. The mosaic at their feet was endless, the multicolored stones creating a pattern that defied comprehension, the strange floor stretching away to every horizon. The echo of their boots was muted and faintly sonorous. I completely forgot this is what the Azath Warren looks like. I know it, but it's, I say that it's like I do and don't. It's, it's such a, there's a very core memory for me here at Coming inside of here in this Azath, but the idea that, yes, think about this. I mean, this stretches out to, I'm assuming to infinity. <laughs> and if it's tiled like this, what is this saying? Dude, it's really cool. <laughs> if it's tiled like this, we'll get a little bit further and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Fiddler hitched his crossbow over one shoulder with a shrug. He said, we'd see trouble from a league away. Pust paced in circles around the group. He hissed, you're all betraying the Azath. The jag belongs beneath a root-webbed mound. That was the deal, the agreement, the scheme. His voice fell away briefly, then resumed in a different tone. What agreement? Did Shadowthrone receive any answers to his query? Did the Azath reveal its ancient stony face? No. Silence was the reply to all. My master could have pronounced his intention to defecate on the house's portal, and still the reply would not have changed. Silence. Well, it certainly seemed there was a consensus. No objections were voiced, were they? No, not at all. Certain assumptions were necessary. Oh, yes, very necessary. And in the end, there was a sort of victory, was there not? All before that jag there in the Trell's arms. He stopped panting as he regained his breath. He said, Gods, we are walking forever. Absalar said, We should begin our journey. Fiddler muttered, I'm for that. Only which direction? Relok had knelt down to study the mosaic tiles. They were the only source of light. Overhead was pitch black. Each tile was no longer than a hand's width. The glow they cast pulsed in a slow but steady rhythm. What a cool visual this is. It's almost like something you'd see in VR in a Tron-like realm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. This is a grid going out in every direction, and that's the only yeah. source of light. It's odd, but it's, it doesn't feel threatening, though. No. Some of the other wards we've been in, you know, there's always that, like, is there something following us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There's something behind us. <laughs> Yeah, certainly the Imperial Warren. Definitely. Yes. Oh, yeah. Relok now grunted. Apslar asked, Father? He pointed to a tile and said, The pattern here, that mottled line. Fiddler crouched down and studied the floor. He said, If that's a track or something, it's a crooked one. Relok said, A track? He looked up and said, No, here, along this side. That's the Connie's coastline. Fiddler asked, What? Relok ran one blunt fingertip down the ragged line. He said, Starts on the Quan coast down to Khan, then up to Khan Vor. And there, that's Kartul Island. And southeast there, in the Tile Center, that's Malaz Island. So in the Tile Center lies Malaz Island. Do you take that to mean that each tile will have an Azath centered within the tile? That would be my guess. Back to something we said either last week or a couple weeks ago about how many Azath there are. That's mm -hmm. a ridiculous number of Azath. Yes, and think about this. We know of two, at least in this realm, at least two. So we can assume that there's probably more for each realm, but this appears to be almost infinite. So yes, I mean, the, the, the number of Azath has to be, in, it's gotta be countless. <laughs> it boggles the mind. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Separately, I thought it was cool to see Relox's skills in reading maps as a retired sailor come in handy here. Yeah. Nice to see him do something else other than be servant. <laughs> yes. Fiddler said, you're trying to tell me that here, on this one tile at our feet, is mapped most of the Quan Tally continent? Yet even as he asked, the pattern resolved itself. And before him was indeed what Absalar's father had claimed. He softly asked, then what is on the rest of them? 
Relox said, well, they ain't consistent, if that's what you're wondering. There's breaks, other maps of other places, I guess. It's all jumbled, but I'd say the scale was the same on all of them. Fiddler slowly straightened. He said, but that means... His voice trailed into silence as he looked out upon the endless floor, stretching for leagues in every direction. He thought, every god in the abyss. Are these all the realms? Every world, every place home to a house of the Azath, queen of dreams. What power is this? And I think we've kind of hinted, I didn't quite say it here, but is this the, is this the multiverse? Is this a multiverse? I'm thinking that it is. Yeah, I would think so. Can't get... Yeah too far into why i think that beyond what we already know yes 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 and but the azath are the key to it somehow are they the tower <laughs> are they the dark well the tower? dark tower is just one right it is but it is the hub of all the multiverse basically so in a weird way it's not necessarily but maybe in some weird way there's some kind of reality control check <laughs> mm. <laughs> or something i don't know what we know they're a power check Right. Of some sort, but I'm curious. Yeah. Again, Mr. Erickson leaves a lot to the imagination here. And that's what's, again, what makes so much of his writing so good. He doesn't have to answer it. Any attempt to answer that only cheapens things sometimes. Plant a seed, water it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it. And walk off. <laughs> or walk away. Just walk away. Just walk <laughs> if he dies, it dies. Yeah. With awe, Mappo said, within the warren of the Azath, you could go anywhere. Crocus asked, are you sure of that? Here are the maps, yes, but he pointed down at the tile displaying the continent of Quantali and said, where's the gate? The way in? No one spoke for a long moment. Then Fiddler cleared his throat. He asked, you got an idea, lad? Crocus shrugged and said, maps are maps. This one could be sitting on a tabletop, if you see my point. Fiddler asked, so what do you suggest? Crocus said, ignore it. The only thing these tiles signify is that every house in every place is part of a pattern, a grand design. But even knowing that doesn't mean we can actually make sense of it. The Azath is beyond even the gods. We can end up getting lost in suppositions in a mental game that takes us nowhere. That's a pretty good recommendation from someone so young. It is, but think about who he learned that lesson from. He lived with his Uncle Mammoth, who spent what appeared his life doing very similar things getting lost in suppositions <laughs> mm, so you learned and, what not to do yeah i think so fiddler grunted that's true enough and we're nowhere closer to figuring out which direction to walk in apslar said perhaps iskrel pust has the right idea her boots grated on the tiles as she turned she said alas he seems to have disappeared crocus spun around and shouted damn that bastard <laughs> The High Priest of Shadow, who had been ceaselessly circling them, was indeed nowhere to be seen. Fiddler grimaced and said, so he figured it out and didn't bother explaining before taking his leave. Mappo said, wait! He set Ikarium down, then took a dozen paces. He said, here, hard to make out at first, but now I see it clearly. Mappo seemed to be staring at something at his feet. Fiddler asked, what have you found? Mappo said, come closer, almost impossible to see otherwise, though that makes little sense. The others approached. A gaping hole yawned, a ragged gap where Iskrel Pust had simply fallen through and vanished. Fiddler knelt, edging closer to the hole. He groaned, hood's breath. The tiles were no more than an inch thick. Beneath them was not solid ground. Beneath them there was nothing. Mm. That would be quite scary. Very, yeah. I agree. Very scary. To stand on something thinking it's not going to hold your weight. I'm picturing Indiana Jones on the Last Crusade where he was on those tiles that were collapsing under him. Oh, yeah. He yes. had to spell yes. Jehovah. <laughs> yes. yes. That's exactly what I'm picturing this as. Yeah. That's a good visual. I'd say that's a good way to look at it. Mappo asked, is that the way out, do you think? Fiddler edged back, the slick tile suddenly feeling like the thinnest ice. He said, damned if I know, but I don't plan on jumping in and finding out. Mappo rumbled, I share your caution. He turned back to where Ikarium lay and gathered his companion once again in his arms. Crocus said, that hole might spread. I suggest we get moving, any direction, just away from here. Apslar hesitated. She asked, and Iskrol pussed? Perhaps he's lying unconscious on a ledge or something. Fiddler replied, not a chance. From what I saw, the poor man's still falling. One look and every bone in me screamed oblivion. I think I'll trust my instincts on this one, lass. Apslar said, a sad demise. I had grown almost fond of him. 
Fiddler nodded and said, our very own pet scorpion, I. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if her fondness of him was rooted in some experience with Cotillion, as opposed to her own genuine fondness for him. What do you think of that? There's probably, there may be a little of both here. There may be, I think there is some of that from Cotillion, but I think it's also because of that link in her own mind, she might have grown kind of fond of him in a weird way because she can see right through him. <laughs> mm-hmm. But she may, maybe she thought it, maybe it was her comic relief because everyone else is too serious. Yeah. <laughs> Crocus took the lead as they moved away from the hole. Had they waited a few minutes longer, they would have seen a dull yellow mist rise from the gaping darkness, thickening until it was opaque. The mist remained for a time, then it began to dissipate. And when it finally vanished, so too had the hole as if it had never been. The mosaic was complete once more. Interesting. I wonder what that yellow mist is. Well, I guess it was either healing the wound in the Azath, which was not really a wound, or it's the medium through which the teleportation affects. Or if that's what they're doing is teleporting, maybe. You know how they travel through wards here. I'm assuming that kind of travel. It's the ward opener or whatever. (laughs) The gateway, maybe. Closing. Mm. I was thinking it's some type of repair function, but what's controlling it, the mechanism there, don't have any idea. Yeah. And as far as I'm aware of, we still have none. Mm -hmm. Mappo thought, Dead House, Malice City, the heart of the Malazan Empire. There is nothing for us there. More, an explanation that made sense would challenge even my experienced inventiveness. We must, I fear, take our leave. Somehow. But this is far beyond me, this Warren. And worse, my crimes are like wounds that refuse to close. I cannot escape my cowardice. In the end, and all here know it, though they do not speak of it, my selfish desires made a mockery of my integrity, my vows. I had a chance to see the threat ended, ended forever. How can friendship defeat such an opportunity? How can the comfort of familiarity rise up like a god, as if change itself had become something demonic? I am a coward the offer of freedom, the sighing end to a lifetime's vow, proved the greatest terror of all. And so the simple truth, the tracks we have walked in for so long become our lives, in themselves a prison. This is such a sad inner monologue from Mappo. I don't see the loyalty to Ikarium as a weakness. The only thing I could be missing here that I can think of is whether Mappo's fear of change and abandoning his vow supersede his loyalty to Ikarium as a friend. What do you think? You know, it's what's funny is he sees these people as seeing him this way. And I don't think any of these people see him this way. I don't see his friendship with Ikarium as a weakness, but I can see how he might see that it is because his vow was to take care of and or find a way to, you know, eventually get rid of Ikarium. I mean, correct, and that his whole purpose is avowed to stay, you know, was to find a way to dispose of this peacefully so that the rest of the world was safe. I don't know what the terms of the vow were. Was it just to prevent him from going crazy and destroying a civilization, or was it if the opportunity arises, take him out? I don't know. See, I feel that it is that. I feel there was a lot of this, especially because, you know, Pust has mentioned it like, man, we're supposed to be doing this. We're supposed to be getting rid of this old boy here. And now this is the time. This is the chance. This is the place. If there's ever going to be a time to get rid of Bacarium, this is our time. <laughs> so I feel that, it, I think that Mappo had come to this and realized that he couldn't do it because he loves him. I mean, that's his buddy. I mean, they're, they're friends. And I can see how you can see that as a failure because this is, he set out here to find a way to take care of him eventually. You know, and I mean, like, take care of, like, take him out um, <laughs> if the opportunity presented itself. Maybe. Apslar leapt forward, her fingertips touching shoulder, then braids, then nothing. Her momentum took her forward into the place where Mapo and Akarium had been a moment earlier. She fell toward a yawning darkness. Crying out, Crocus grasped her ankles. He was pulled momentarily along the tiles toward the gaping hole before a fisherman's strong hands closed on him and anchored him down. Together, the two men dragged Absalar from the pit's edge. A dozen paces beyond it stood Fiddler. Crocus's cry had been the first intimation of trouble. Crocus shouted, They're gone! They fell through! There was no warning, Fid! Nothing at all! Fiddler softly cursed, lowering himself into an uneasy crouch. He thought, We're intruders here. He'd heard rumors of warrens that were airless, that were instant death to mortals who dared enter them. 
There was an arrogance in assuming that every realm in existence bowed to human needs. He thought, intruders, this place cares nothing for us, nor are there any laws demanding that it accommodate us. Mind you, the same could be said for any world. Fiddler hissed, slowly straightened, fighting against the sudden welling of grief at the loss of two men he had come to consider friends. He thought, and which of us is next? He growled, to me, all three of you, carefully. He unslung his pack, set it down, and rummaged inside until he found a coiled length of rope. He said, we're tying ourselves together. If one goes, either we save him or her, or we all go. Agreed? Relieved nods answered him. He thought, aye, the thought of wandering alone in this warren is not a pleasant one. They quickly attached the rope between them. The four travelers had walked another thousand paces when the air stirred, the first wind they had felt since entering the warren, and they ducked as one beneath the passage of something enormous directly overhead. Scrabbling for his crossbow, Fiddler twisted around to look skyward. He said, Hood's breath! But the three dragons were already past, ignoring the humans entirely. They flew in triangular formation, like a flight of geese, and were of a kind, ochre scaled, their wing spans as far across as five wagons end to end. Long, sinuous tails stretched back behind them. Who is this? I have so many questions here. I know. I know. I was going to ask you do you recall if we come upon this scene elsewhere from another vantage point i don't recall offhand i don't i'm trying to think of who ochre dragons would even be yeah Apslar muttered foolish to think that we're the only ones to make use of this realm crocus grunted i've seen bigger <laughs> <laughs> of course trying to one-up everybody yeah a faint grin cracked fiddler's features he said i lad i know you have the dragons were almost at the edge of their vision when they banked as one plunged down toward the ground and broke through the tiles, vanishing from sight. Now that is a core image that has always been there for me. I don't know why, because it implies, well, I know why, because them punching through that implies that they know what's what, they know how to use this somehow. Yes. I just wish I knew who it was. I know it. <laughs> or where they're going. It's killing me. It's like, you three are the only ones that I've seen in this entire series that seem to have some understanding of what an Azath even is. <laughs> <laughs> No one spoke for a long minute, then Apslar's father cleared his throat and said, I think that just told us something. Filler nodded and said, aye. He thought, you go through when you get to where you're going, even if you don't exactly plan on it. He thought back to Mapo and Ikarium. The Trell would have had no reason to accompany them all the way to Malice City. After all, Mapo had a friend to heal, to coax back to consciousness. He'd be looking for a safe place to do that. As for Iskrol Pust... Probably at the cliff's foot right now, screaming up at the Baccarala for a rope. <laughs> <laughs> Fiddler straightened and said, All right, seems we've just got to keep moving until the time and place arrives. With obvious relief, Crocus said, Mapo and Ikarium are not lost, not dead. They began walking again. Apslar added, Nor is the high priest. <laughs> <laughs> Crocus muttered, Well, I suppose we have to take the bad with the good. Fiddler briefly wondered about those three dragons, where they had gone, what tasks awaited them. Then he shrugged. Their appearance, their departure, and in between, and most importantly, their indifference to the four mortals below was a sobering reminder that the world was far bigger than that defined by their own lives, their own desires and goals. The seemingly headlong plunge this journey had become was in truth but the smallest succession of steps, of no greater import than the struggles of a termite. He thought, the worlds live on, beyond us, countless unraveling tales. In his mind's eye, he saw his horizon stretch out on all sides, and as they grew ever vaster, he in turn saw himself as ever smaller, ever more insignificant. He thought, we are all lone souls. It pays to know humility, lest the delusion of control, of mastery overwhelms. And indeed, we seem a species prone to that delusion, again and ever again. I wonder if the dragons also have the same tendency to think everything revolves around them. I imagine that almost anything with some kind of self-awareness and intelligence, at least on what I, what, you know, approaching human-ish type intelligence, you know, where, you know, what would, would do that. I mean, I think that we would all think that way. I would think dragons probably even more inclined, yes. given they're more powerful. Yeah. They can, bo they can warp reality in some ways, in some cases. Yeah. So it's like, dude, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, they probably think that too. I mean, yeah. So, all right, we're gonna stop there and we'll finish out the chapter next week. Mm, good episode for standout moments. 
Kalam's ability to stem the bleeding and control his body temperature were really impressive skills. That is really cool. And I mean, really cool. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, Billy. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But that is awesome. I do like seeing Kalam. Excellent pun. I have a friend that actually listens to the podcast that is the champion of puns. He'll probably appreciate that. Okay, good, 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 good. The skill difference that was evident between Kalam and the other claw quite the gap there is this like a homeschool public school gap <laughs> <laughs> well i'm pl- not gonna dive noticeable. into that <laughs> i'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna say private school I'm public teasing. school okay there okay we go. <laughs> private school public school i'll go for that yeah <laughs> it's like we are definitely seeing like i feel pretty bad kind of for these fellows here the way that he, i mean dude i still can't get over that he punched through a guy's head basically it's like <laughs> It didn't go all the way through, sure, but he drove a piece of the guy's brain into his skull, his septum, his nose. He's like, dude. It's crazy that the picture I have of all of the other assassins, it, they're kind of effeminate, yeah, girly men. Thin, you know, they're, they're not thin fellows. They're fi- they're a bunch it, yeah. of thin fellows. You know, they'd wear skinny jeans. <laughs> yes, comfortably. Yes. You know, yes. and, and Kalam is the exact opposite of that. Burly, huge. He, it's like. I have two images. What's funny, I I have to combine two people in a weird way. It's like you need someone built kind of like uh, like The Rock, <laughs> Jack but, Reacher. Yeah, yes, yes. Or have you yeah. seen the? Have you heard about the new villain this year? How tall yeah. this boy is? He's, he's seven foot he's two. Seven <laughs> two. I'm like, good gracious, that's a tall fella. That's a tall fella. Yeah. But but, I'm, but imagine Jack Reacher, but that has the moves, the running moves of Barry Sanders. Yeah, good comparison. Yeah. Dude, because it's like a linebacker but at the same time he's graceful yet he doesn't have to he's not really graceful he's just he doesn't have, doesn't care he's just a bull he's gonna, your grace is going to get you killed this guy's going to plow through all your defenses and by the time you're trying anything he's got your you know he's got your eyeballs and under his thumbs <laughs> yeah he's a bad dude it's really quite the combination of <laughs> skills that he has that yes. just really makes him a head and shoulders above everybody even not using magic that's what's incredible about it and the, back to your reacher comment it's almost like you see this guy getting if someone hurts him it's like all you've done is now you've made him mad <laughs> like, wow now he's really mad it's like oh good come on hey, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh nice yeah uh, Kalam's lack of reliance on magic to enhance his abilities. That's one of the things I love the most about him. uh, Let's just both agree that, man, it's just the Kalam love fest. We finally see him start to unleash the beast and every bit of it is amazing, dude. It's not, it's not more plays, more (laughs) plays. And his ambush on the hand leader and the subsequent conversation with Topper through the corpse. I really liked the meat telephone scene. It is. This is again, how how he blends so many different weirdnesses here and how that is just straight out of a horror movie blended with this killer assassin flick so it's like dude it's 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 amazing it's it's amazing the scene with the hands turning the imperial warren into swiss cheese popping Mm -hmm. into malice city everyone showing up to get kalam that was i love that scene i i have flashbacks to gardens Remember when that group, they're falling, they're floating down slowly. I kind of have this in my brain, even though I know that's not what's happening, but I just see just like, it's raining. It's <laughs> raining, men. It's raining. As- <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, it's raining assassins. And yeah, I'm not sure yeah, if there are men and yeah. women, but yeah, it's like. But there, yeah, there were but females in there. I was, but, but they're yeah. all a bunch of thin fellows in my brain, though, except for Kalam. <laughs> Yeah, that, it's weird that that's just the picture I have of all of them besides him. Because who do we know? We got Topper, who's weasel like, yeah, and yeah. he's kind of skinny. And then you have Pearl, which described as effeminate, yeah. kind of like a Johnny Depp type character, I guess, <laughs> right. where yeah. you know he's wearing all these rings like Jack Sparrow. Yes, yes. I don't know. Lots of green. Is it, is it Topper with the green, or is it Pearl with? Is Topper with the green? Isn't it? Can't remember. Uh, one of the. Fellow, I get them mixed but, up sometimes. But yeah, one of them's half yeah. tissed Andy, so I know that they're kind of. Th- I imagine them as thin, tall, elvish style kind mm-hmm. of folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, it, it's just like it's, it, and they constantly mention it, the fact of the how he is so unlike all the other claw i mean there's no other claw i think the closest thing we could come to him physical wise would be bowden as a talon 
I imagine him as kind of a burly fella. I got a really different picture of Bowden. He's more like a strong man to me, like an Eddie Hall type. I don't know if you know who Eddie Hall is, but like he's got a big beer belly. Sure. Big dude. Yeah. Uh, where Kalam, he's just like you described earlier, like a physical specimen, like yeah. the most fit football player you can imagine. Yeah. Or like a rugby player is a really good example because yeah. they're so athletic. It's that type of build, but yeah. big, like six foot two, six foot four, somewhere in there, you know, just a huge man. The crazy thing also implied by his ability over himself, dude, this is very similar to the Ben and Jesuit and Dune. Their complete muscle mastery over every single muscle and tendon. I mean, it's almost down to that. It's almost down to the same thing for him. Yes. The visual of the tiled floor within the Azath Warren going to the horizon every direction. That's a really cool image. Also very different than anything that I've pictured in this book so far. It's almost sci-fi-esque. Yes. Well, it's, you know, I think why that is for me is because so much of this book is dusty, dirty, grimy, gritty, bloody. And here, and even the realms are dusty, gritty, grimy, and uh, except for this realm seems almost clean and just, mm -hmm. you know, other than this lit up floor, very empty. It's one of the least threatening warns we've been into, I think is the best way of saying it. So it, it does, it, that doesn't give it that kind of sci-fi vibe, especially if, if you weren't looking at the images on the tiles, that would just look like lit up tiles. You know, that, that's the light for the realm. Yeah. And they're not complaining about it being dark in here. It's apparently enough light in the realm to see fine. Right, right. And then finally, the three dragons appearing in the Warren of the Azath. Mm. That was pretty cool. And then the way they just, like you mentioned, your core memory of them dipping into the yeah. floor, just like punching through. Really yeah. cool. That really sits with me, like I said, because that's such a core th part for me. But man, that, like I said, them going through the floor, it's, the, it's not just that. It's they know how to use it. <laughs> it may be the most basic function of an Azath that they're using, but at least someone is using it correctly, for goodness sake. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, great job tonight, Billy. Hey, great episode, man. Boy, we're getting right down to the nitty gritty here, aren't we? Love it. Dude, yeah, it's, it's we're getting real close to the end. Woo, yes, sir. Fantastic episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? No, just what a great start to this chapter. I can't wait to get to the rest of it next week. <laughs> I don't want to think about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm not going to say any more. I don't want to get beeped again. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. And we'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.